stores at undisclosed locations, keeps no logs, and uses military-grade encryption to protect sources and other confidential information. In some countries, there are no ways for people to get in touch with reliable journalists to even find out who they could trust. So it's very important to offer one entity like us uh, that, that has a reputation and that is offering this anonymous way for people to submit this information. The web is a barrier to a state that's trying to control information. And it's an it's a impossible task for them as people have personal computers and they can encrypt information and send it to other people who have the key. You can't get in the middle there and get it at that information. And once you publish something, the ability to find it and you know, stop it from spreading is, is near impossible. And so even though there's efforts to do that, you know, states are going to have to admit that information will be out there. Publishing sensitive and often damaging documents on the web means WikiLeaks is under constant attack. In February 2008 came a court injunction by a Swiss bank, Bank Julius Baer, after WikiLeaks published allegations about tax evasion. This was the first big case where an organization tried to legally go after us. So we published documents about hundreds of millions in tax evaded money. A judge in California, where the case was brought, ruled that the WikiLeaks site be taken offline. But if the bank saw that as a victory, it was sadly mistaken. The only effect was that half the world got interested in the bank's documents. So the New York Times published our IP address. Um, CBS News said, uh, Freedom of speech has a number and published our IP address. So these are, again, dynamic effects that sharing knowledge with people all over the world can produce them. You can easily have a court rule that one story gets deleted from your digital archive. On the other hand, the internet is not such a controlled environment anymore and it consists of individuals. And all these individuals can just make sure that some information stays where it was or will still be available in numerous other places. There's a famous quote that says, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. And when John Gilmore said that, he actually wasn't being metaphorical. He was literally describing the communication protocols of the internet. So if you're trying to get a message from point A to point B, on the internet, it's sort of like driving from place A to place B. You got a network of roads. There's multiple ways that you could drive. Well, censorship is a kind of a blockage in the roads. It's like putting up a wall saying messages can't get through. It's in the very protocols of the internet that if that happens, that condition is detected and it goes to a fallback and says, okay, I can't get through this way. Is there another road by which I can get there? and the internet's protocols find other ways to get through. It's not just the hardware that enables resistance to censorship. When a government or organization tries to block a website, there's always some highly motivated geek with the necessary computing skills to play David to the state's Goliath. I think that the reason you see so many people taking on governments is because with computers, we're all on a level playing field. You know, when I was young, I think that's one of the first things I realized was, wow, I can sit here behind my dial-up modem and program just as well and do everything that somebody with a bigger computer can do. The way the web enables individuals to root around censorship and blockages is shown clearly again by the Iranian crisis. Once the Iranian government realized what was going on, they blocked sites like Twitter and Facebook. On the other side of the world, a 25-year-old San Franciscan was moved to action. Austin Heap used his programming skills to develop Haystack, an encryption program so-called because it hides in everyday web data. He claims it's a secure way for ordinary Iranians to load sites blocked by their government. So what I have set up right here is I'm piping my connection through a machine inside of Iran. 
so that anything I do here will be subject to the same filtering technologies that somebody there would experience. So with normal filtering in Iran, I'm just going to go ahead and try to load Facebook.com. And what happens is you quickly get the access denied site. It's not even making that connection to Facebook. It's just getting terminated by their filters. So I'm going to turn Haystack on. And then I'm just going to go ahead and click Reload. And on this side of the screen, you'll quickly see what Haystack is doing. That's a lot of numbers. See, now from Iran, we've loaded Facebook. And everything you do with Haystack running is secure. It's encrypted. It can't be filtered. You know, there's no chance that they're going to find out what your login was and then try to trace that back to who you are in real life. You see all of this media that comes out that's incredibly graphic. And I would have my daily breakdown. <laughs> and you just have to kind of have it and get over it, you know, because the next day may be worse. It's not bad for me. I'm not there. I may cry for 10 minutes, but that's their life. So the web gives citizens power to root around censorship. And its ease of access gives them an unparalleled ability to blow the whistle on wrongdoing. Bring these elements together, and you have the tools for motivated people to gather around a single issue very quickly. In some ways, the web seems to be taking us back to a world before party politics, a world of direct action. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the campaign here in Britain on climate change. The web is not going to rival the state. It's not threatening to wipe the state out. But what it does possibly threaten to do is to make various forms of national politics irrelevant because people can bypass them. In the past, membership of a political party or uh, you know, voting in our elections was one of the only ways in which you could express your politics. And the state would much prefer it if that was the only way in which we expressed our politics. But traditional electoral politics is becoming less and less relevant. Essentially, my generation and people younger than me feel completely disillusioned with mainstream party politics. So where does that leave you if those people are not representing your views? You need a different forum and a different media in which to express your politics. And in the past, you were quite limited in your ability to do that. Whereas now, you're able to express your own views simply by logging onto the internet. At an event organized by the Climate Camp for Action, designed to shut down a coal-fired power station in Nottinghamshire, activists come together from all over the country. Everyone here is the media, filming events as they unfold. Footage and stills are uploaded to their website through constant updates. But the web provides more than just tools for protest. Its connections inspire solidarity in the group. I think that the nature of community has changed. Before the internet, the only communities that you could be a part of were communities that you could physically uh, be present in, right? So, you know, you, you would have to be geographically close to the other people in it or, um, or part of some existing organisation or structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas now, you can suddenly decide one day, you know what, I want to do something about climate change, for instance, and you can just log on to the climate campsite, sign up for an email list, and suddenly you're involved in that discussion and you're a member of that community. The web is this fantastic resource for transmitting information and gathering people together around an issue, even in a particular place. But it's very, very short term. What the web can do is throw up coalitions out of nothing and it can blow them away again. What the state can do is over decades, over centuries, entrench people's identities, organize their fears, organize their hopes. I think the internet empowers uh, anyone who can use it and, and, it and it empowers the people who can use it most effectively uh, even more. It can empower a government to, re to, re to repress an insurrection. It can empower the, the insurrection itself. It's a double-edged sword.
We've seen how the web hands tremendous power to the individual and provides purpose and cohesion to disparate groups.